Arduinos, and I'm going to talk about Raspberry Pis, which are somewhat similar and related. Raspberry Pis are very small Linux computers. They're about this size. Uh, does that look the same size as any other kind of computer you've seen? Looks about the same size as a cell phone, and it's using the same chips. Uh, this chip here, right in the middle, is a Broadcom SoC. Same kind of processor used in cell phones, but you'll notice it's missing a screen and it doesn't have a cellular radio and it's missing a lot of other cell phone stuff and it doesn't have a battery. And that's why it only costs $35. It's also got other things like USB ports, Ethernet jacks, GPIO pins, things you wouldn't need on a cell phone but which are really handy when you're trying to do something else like maybe control a robot. Anyway, there are a lot of different kinds of Raspberry Pis. Uh, this one I'm holding here is one of those first two, which are the uh, original Raspberry Pis from when they first came out. The one in the top middle, right in the blurry area of the projector, is the latest Raspberry Pi. That one includes, it has a built-in Wi-Fi, built-in Bluetooth, and a whole lot more processing power than the first ones. Still at the same price point. In the top right, at the very end, is a Raspberry Pi Zero. That's one they made recently, and they're selling it for $5. If you think a $5 computer sounds a little too good to be true, well, you would be right. You still need a SD card and a network connector and things like that, so you're going to be closer to $20 or $25 if you want to actually use one. But it's still pretty cheap, a lot cheaper than another brand of computer fruit. And the Raspberry Pi Foundation is not the only place that makes these. Uh, there's a few other types that I have pictures of down there. They have follow a general theme of Raspberry Pi is usually the cheapest and for a lot of applications the best, mostly because it's cheapest. Uh, there's a whole lot of other ones that have more features or more processing power and are also generally have more price to match. And you just heard about Arduinos. There's another picture of an Arduino. And they sometimes get used in very similar roles to Raspberry Pis because they both have GPIO pins, which are the pins you just heard about for controlling LEDs, motors, and other related things. They're also, they also support other types of communication like serial, I2C, and SPI, which you may or may not have heard of before, but those are uh, protocols that are used for talking to other kinds of chips, Arduinos and even lower level chips. Raspberry Pi also has a single PWM pin, which uh, we might get to that later when we start turning the lights on and off. I made a small table of a cost comparison. The, uh, I was kind of surprised to learn that cheap laptops are apparently cheaper than a cheap desktop these days. But another interesting thing is if you have a server running some piece of software and you can put the software on a Raspberry Pi and turn the server off, well, the Pi is made out of cell phone parts. And cell phones run on batteries, so they have to be extremely energy efficient. And the Pi has that same energy efficiency. So it can actually pay for itself in electrical savings after a few months. And I've been talking about the hardware, but I haven't mentioned the software yet. Raspberry Pi runs Linux. Uh, how many of you have heard of or used Linux at all before? Oh, quite a few people. Well, anyway, it runs the exact same Linux as other much larger computers. Here are a few basic facts. It broke the, uh, the Linux GitHub repository actually broke the number of contributors counter. They did not break the commits counter, though. I'm not sure why the contributors counter broke first. You think it would There's the Debian repository, which if you're at all familiar with the repository, it's like an app store, but everything is free and there are no ads. And you can use it for the command line. And it's used in many areas like robotics, web servers, and other things that you might want a Raspberry Pi for. Some people like me use it on desktop computers too.
it's a small minority. I have also heard, I have not tried this myself, but I have heard that it is possible to put Windows on a Raspberry Pi. Microsoft made a special Windows IoT core, which runs on Raspberry Pis and a few other things. I'm not sure why you would want to do this, but you can if you want to. Some people do it. I don't know why, but they do. Well, that's what's in it, which leads to interesting questions about what are the applications. And I went on the internet and I found some applications. This one is pretty much a software project. It doesn't really use the Pi's hardware stuff. It's something you could do on any Linux computer. Raspberry Pi is convenient because it's cheap and small and it still does what other Linux computers do. So this was a kind of a data privacy project to help stop people from spying, if you're worried about that kind of thing. And it's based on Tor. Many of you here have heard of Tor or Onion Rally before. Uh, we had one hand raised. But the Tor project is uh, it's a thing called Onion Routing that it masks internet traffic by routing it through a probably get through several hops through a network to make it difficult to tell which computer is communicating with it, which other computer. And most of their funding comes from the U.S. State Department, and it's supposed to like help uh, journalists and stuff in repressive countries hide their identities. And while the State Department is funding them, the NSA is trying very hard to break their protections. So kind of a conflict of interest there. But anyway, what this setup does is, if I had my laser pointer, I would point, but down here in the bottom corner, there's an Ethernet jack, which goes out to public internet, and there's a Wi-Fi antenna, and it makes a wireless access point and acts as a router. And then, any traffic that it gets over that wireless network, it funnels through Tor. Here's a kind of a neat hardware project. Uh, a lot of people have been trying to make handheld video game consoles out of Raspberry Pis. And this guy kind of went the extra mile. If you look at the top left picture from the side, you'll see it's kind of thin. And if you look at an actual Raspberry Pi, there are a couple of thick things. The USB ports, the Ethernet shield kind of stick up. So the guy who built this actually pulled the uh, USB ports and the Ethernet jack off, and then soldered extenders onto them, which is why they're uh, sticking out the side instead of out the end like they normally would be. And then he got a LCD screen from somewhere and put a very tiny keyboard on it and used it as a Nintendo DS emulator. I've also seen other projects for making things like old-fashioned arcade cabinets that run on these things. Here's an RC car. I found this one on the internet. A couple years ago, I made my own RC car off a Raspberry Pi, and then while I was making this presentation, I realized that I forgot to take pictures of it. So I went ahead to find pictures of somebody else's RC car. They have nicer hardware than I did, but mine had a camera, so it did things there. So anyway, you can see the Raspberry Pi there, and the RC car, the hardware is pretty simple. It's got a couple of motors, and then to make it go forward, you turn the motors on. And to make it turn, you, you know, turn one side of the motor on more than the other. So hardware-wise, it's fairly simple. But with the Raspberry Pi, you can do some interesting things. Like, for example, the Raspberry Pi can join a Wi-Fi network and let you control it over the internet. The people who did this project, and also me too, had a web page where you could control it through a web browser. And you can also hook them up to things like computer game pads and control it that way. It's also possible Raspberry Pi has enough processing power that it can handle things like streaming video. So you can put a video camera on it and stream video back and maybe control your RC car remotely without being able to see it. 
except through the camera. It's a little tricky to drive them when you're only seeing from the camera on the car, but it can be done. It's also tricky to get the video latency down to where it's useful, but that can be done too. And here is a somewhat similar project that I worked on with a school club a while ago, Students for Exploration and Development of Space. Uh, this is very similar to the RC car, but uh, we were thinking about how would you make a vehicle that can drive around inside of a space station. It would need propellers. There's no gravity, so it can't drive on the ground. But there's air, and it can push against the air, like a helicopter. You'll notice you kind of have to squint to see, oh, in the bottom right you can see the propellers clearly. You'll notice they're very small propellers. The motors are also right under the propellers, and you might not even be able to see those. They're very small motors. Well, that's because on a space station, safety is a big concern. Otherwise, the setup is very similar to the Raspberry Pi RC car. It's got a camera, and streams video back, and you can control it remotely. Also, if you look in the bottom left, inside it, you can see a, um, it's actually not running on a Raspberry Pi, it's running on an Odroid V3, which is one of those uh, similar types of computers that were on the, I think it was the second slide. And the other white rectangle on the bottom right is a battery pack. Here's a funny one I found. It can control Legos. And here, the practical application is making YouTube videos. And I did not even try to embed a video in this presentation. It was an open office, and I had to convert it and stuff. So we're just going to launch it on the website. If you look closely, oh, it's moving around. The background, well, I'll just let you watch it for a minute. If you look closely, right here is a blue rectangle. That is a micro servo. You can find them on eBay for about $2. They do the same thing as a Lego servo does, except they cost $2 instead of $20. Also, nearly all of them are blue. I don't know why blue is so popular, but it is. Kind of similar to what you can do with those Lego Mines drums kit, but instead of a $300 kit, it's a Raspberry Pi and some $2 servos. Now, 
you may look at some of those neat projects and think they look kind of complicated and maybe you're new to electronics and you've only learned to turn LEDs on. Well, with just turning LEDs on, you can make stuff like this, including artwork. I've also seen things like LED cubes, where they'll have a big cube that lights up with LEDs and they can make 3D sculptures and that kind of stuff. And if you're still not sure how to turn LEDs on, I can show you how to do that. a pin out for controlling one LED, you'll need a GPIO pin and a ground pin. So we can use the uh, pin number three, second from the top left, and the ground pin right by. I needs power. I don't actually have a USB power supply, so I'm going to use the USB port on my laptop.
take that long when I tested it earlier this afternoon. Get a Raspberry Pi, the first thing you'll see is a setup screen where you can tell things like whether to start at a GUI or a command line. As you can see, I prefer a command line. But a Raspberry Pi is a general purpose computer. You can program it in any language you like. The Raspberry Pi Foundation makes a lot of libraries available in Python. So, that is the easiest one to use here. And one of those libraries is especially for controlling GPIO pens. Next step, which is honestly kind of a silly step, is the GPIO library requires you to tell it which mode it's using. And that is because the Raspberry Pi pens have two different numbering schemes. There's the scheme Raspberry Pi uses, and there's the scheme the S uh, SOC uses. And the two sets of numbers are different. So you have to tell it which one you're using. a warning if it was uh, in use by an earlier script. If the earlier script is exited, that does not matter. This will tell pin 3 to go to state 1, which is on. As you can't see it very well, I will switch to back in the camera. It is a little bit hard for you to see the uh, tiny LED from back in the audience. So, I have a very bright LED. This is a 10 watt LED. It has a heat sink. It needs a heat sink. It does not have to be that big, but it does need one. It's also an RGB LED. It has three color channels. So, to control this for a Raspberry Pi, you can control it in much the way, same way as a regular light. This light runs at 12 volts and burns about an amp. The Raspberry Pi supplies 3.3 volts and tops out at, I think, about 50 milliamps. So the Pi can't run it directly. You need transistors to step it up. The breadboard looks a little bit messy, but the circuit is simple. There's just a lot of wires because there's three circuits, one for each light.
12 volt power supply for the very bright LED. So I borrowed an ATX power supply. Just a power supply out of a regular desktop computer. And it can supply 12 volts, and it can supply 5 volts, and it can supply 3.3 volts. For now, we'll use the 12 volts. cover over it because this is an LED that is bright enough to blind me since I'm looking at it directly. Okay. I saved a script. You see that one starts with importing the library. This time it sets up three pins, pin numbers three, five, and seven, the ones I write, wired to red, green, and blue. And I have a while true loop, which just runs forever until I kill the program. It'll turn one of the lights on, and we'll sleep for one second, and it turns that off and turns the next light on. And it continues like that forever until it is exited. So Python. Works. You can see it turns on the red channel and the green one and then the blue one and it turns them off. What's nice about these LEDs with the three different colors is you can also mix them and blend the colors. Instead of just turning the red light on at first, it will turn the red and the blue lights on at first. So what do you think that will look like? How the red and blue blend together and they make purple. And that's the, that is very similar to the stuff you do on an Arduino. And you can also do computer and server type things on it. So with the Raspberry Pi, it's very easy to, for example, control your light and also run a web server and have a web page or an app that connects to it. And then you can control your light from a web page or an app. So anyway, does anyone have questions about Raspberry Pis? LEDs, or one bright LED I have here, I have several of those in my apartment, which I use for lighting my apartment, and I can control them from, uh, well, I couldn't control them until I took them apart to redesign the whole system, but I have them set up to control them from an uh, app or a browser, They're just a web app, and I can open up my phone and do things like that. 
I've also made a rover that would stream video back. And that project was kind of involved. The hardest part of that was actually getting the video latency down. A lot of videos, you compress them before sending them, and the compression algorithm looks forward and backward in the video. And the algorithm sometimes requires several seconds. So you have to fiddle with the compression and make sure it's set up just right, or you're going to have a very, very slow video. This very, very big LED can draw an amp of current and it's 12 volts. So in terms of electrical load, it's kind of like a motor. And the Raspberry Pi cannot power it. So I have these pets. You can use, there's several different ways to control a motor. Uh, you can use ICs that have all the necessary transistors built in. You can make your own H-bridge out of it's fork transistors for a bi-directional motor. If you only need to go one direction, you can get away with just one transistor. But for motor controls, my favorite is actually to use BETS, uh, especially because most of the motors I've used, I've been running at fairly low voltages. If you use BJT transistors, they have a diode voltage drop that burns like a third of the energy, and then all that energy gets dissipated in your dry work, and then you have melting problems. So, especially for low voltage motors, I like to use FETs for controlling them. If you need to do PWM, what if you want to run a motor at half speed, and you have a digital output that's on or off, and you want it halfway on, well, what you can do is turn it on and off really fast. And that's a, called pulse width modulation at PWM for short. It's possible to do on a Raspberry Pi. You can do it in software, turning it on and off. Uh, the Linux kernel is not a real-time operating system, so there's a limit to how good your timing is going to be. Software PWM on a Raspberry Pi is usually good enough for a motor, but usually not good enough for an LED. And in that case, you pair it with an Arduino or something like that that's more designed for real-time use. in different colors, I have not made them automatically respond to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm suspicious of too much automation. It tends to break. <laughs> One thing I do have been meaning to do, though, is uh, set it up with like a music visualizer. So music could uh, change the colors of the lights. That's on my to-do list. schedule light, right? That was the last talk of the day. So I believe we're done. <laughs>